Good evening. I'm very glad to be in church tonight. Boy, all the music has been tremendous. The special music has been tremendous. That was tremendous. Wow. Let me say that backwards. Wow. Uh, I mean, a tenor singer, really, a, a, a tenor singer, you know, in a quartet or anything, really has the hardest job in the world. I mean, to get to sing those notes. I mean, and then, you know, to, you, you got to look like a man and sing like a woman. Now, that's an impressive thing. Uh, man, that was good. And uh, I, I just want to salute you, uh, all of the, the special music, and, but, but the, uh, the congregational music. Um, you know, everybody has preferences, and uh, nothing is more debated, hotly contested across our country than probably music and church. We all have our preferences, and I, I don't apologize for my preferences. I'm a, I'm a hymns guy. I, listen, there's, how many know that music takes you to a place? Secular music does that. I can tell you that uh, I, I just, uh, you know, again, I like to talk about me. I don't like to talk about you. I'll talk about me. I, I, I was in a grocery store one day, and a, and a rock song from the 80s came on. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what it was. I'm not going to sing it or anything. Uh, but instantly, I mean, the, the, the song started playing, and instantly I was on a date in 1985 with Melissa Fister all over again. I mean, I was reliving that first date. I, 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 that, that song, music takes us to a place. I, don't look at me so spiritual. I, you've got some songs from your past uh, that, that do that to you. Church music is the same. And uh, you think about songs uh, like we've uh, uh, heard tonight. And even, you know, I was in, we, we did our uh, church growth uh, conference in Branson. And uh, we, we came, uh, we took a, a couple trips to Branson to get that ready. And they have several theaters out there, family theaters, and one of them is the Presley's. That's probably the most famous, and if you've been to Branson, maybe you've been there, it's a family show. But before the Presley's theater opens, they have a, a pre-show upstairs where they have a guy that sits down with the piano, and everybody gathers around, and he, he plays one hymn, one, one gospel song after another, and the enjoyment of it, I mean, the place is packed out with people who are singing along. I mean, he goes from I'll Fly Away to Mansion Over a Hilltop to one, just familiar songs and there are people that come in our churches every week that have a history maybe a godly grandma or grandpa or, or, or mom or dad from back in their childhood they remember songs songs take us to places and so uh, I am a firm believer that you know I'm all for variety and, and and some of the new stuff you know is I'm not saying it's sinful or wrong I'm just saying there needs to be a place in this modern day in our churches for traditional hymns uh, and uh, I, I, I really, really strongly feel that way. Now, now some of the new stuff's not bad. I'm just not a, I'm not a big uh, fan of, uh, you know, a lot of repetition, you know, singing. Matter of fact, I sort of feel like the same way that the farmer up there in northeast Ohio, he, uh, he, his wife was ill and he couldn't go to church, so he, uh, he went to the new church downtown, and his wife, he got home, and his wife was asking him how it was, and and uh, he said, well, it was, it was good. He said, uh, it was different. And uh, said they sang uh, something I'd never heard of before. And uh, uh, he said they sang some praise choruses. And certainly nothing wrong with praise choruses. And she said, well, what is a praise chorus? She, did, she had never heard of such a thing. He said, well, here's the best way I can describe it. Uh, she said, if I was to go out this afternoon and find that the cows have gotten out uh, 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 of the pasture and are in the corn. And I was to sing that to you when I got back. I'd come back and say, if I was to sing it in a hymn, I'd say, Martha, oh Martha, the cows are in the corn. So that would be a hymn. Now, if I was to come and sing that to you in a praise course, here's how it would go. Oh, Martha, 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 the cows, the cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the cows, cows, cows are in the corn, the corn, the corn. That is a praise course. That's how he uh, explained it. But in any event, uh, I just wanted to say I'm, uh, I salute your music program and uh, what a blessing uh, that it is. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me. Tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 14. I want to read a few more verses of scripture 
than I normally, normally would uh, because I want to get the whole context of, uh, of uh, what we're looking at here. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14. And uh, of course every service, uh, you know, you really strive uh, to get the right thing. You want to have uh, the right uh, sermon and you pray and uh, uh, take it very seriously. Sometimes every preacher here knows that sometimes uh, the Lord changes uh, your message. And I really, it makes me kind of uncomfortable because I like to be prepared to know what I'm doing. But I have found out a long time ago I've been up here without the Lord helping me and with the Lord helping me. It's a whole lot better for me and for you when, when we're doing what He wants. But sometimes uh, He changes the message. Now I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the hills of uh, eastern Kentucky they have, uh, we call them uh, regular Baptists. Uh, some would call them hard shell Baptists. In other words, they don't have any, they don't have any music. Uh, musical instruments in the church and they have a funeral there about four or five preachers will preach and it's like an all-day event but they they preach in such a style I couldn't even I wouldn't even try to imitate it for you. it's kind of sing-songy and kind of uh, uh, kind of hacking type sing song I don't know if you even know what that means when I say hacking but anyway one uh, it was a summer day, of course the church was a small church up in a holler in eastern Kentucky, didn't have any air conditioning, the doors and windows were open, and uh, the preacher was getting in a big way preaching, and uh, he was just, boy the spirit was moving and he just got in a big way and he said, well, open them doors and open them wide, let them sinners come inside, yeah, and everybody was amen and hallelujah, so it felt so good he said it again, I said open them doors and open them wide, let them sinners come inside, yeah, and there was a some guys working on a construction crew across the street and they heard all of this commotion going on at the church and this guy, he was an atheist, had no fear of God, didn't believe in God and he said to his buddies, he said, if that preacher says that one more time, he's getting on my nerves so bad, I'm going to take one of these concrete blocks and knock him out right in the pulpit. Just as soon as he said it, open them doors and open them wide, let them sinners come inside, yeah. Sure enough, he picked up one of those blocks. He went around to the side door of the church. It was open, and no air conditioning. All the windows and doors were open. And sure enough, he timed it, gave it a heave and go, threw that block, and knocked the, hit the preacher, knocked him out right in the pulpit. Of course, that stopped the service, and the deacons went up there, and they had smelling salts, and they were trying to revive him, got some water and splashed on his face. And the pastor kind of stood up, and finally kind of staggered to his feet, and the deacon said, Pastor, do you want us to close the service? He said, no, put me back in the pulpit. I've got another word from the Lord. He said, well, close them doors and close them quick. Some poor sinner done chunked a brick, yeah. And so uh, sometimes the message changes. But uh, I believe that we have what the Lord would have for us uh, tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 1 says, Now it came to pass upon a day, that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. Notice the next line. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahita, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people, notice this, the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passage by which Jonathan sought to go over under the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes. And the name of the other, Sina. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. Notice the next three words. That's the title of my sermon tonight. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to say by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold I am with thee according to thy heart. 
I take a time out there and say every pastor in America needs somebody like that armor bearer to be by their side. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison <clears throat> answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might be. Wow, what a story. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you that what we have just read has to be considered the absolute worst battle plan ever conceived in the history of military battle. I mean, let's really take that apart and look at it for a few minutes tonight. It has to be I mean, this can't go. I mean, it is seemingly destined for disaster from the beginning. It can't get much worse than the odds that they're facing. First of all, would you notice with me that as Jonathan and his armor bearer go, they are going undermanned. They're undermanned. They are completely outnumbered. Now let's look at this battle. And as they go into this battle, let's look at the sides. Who do we have over on this side? We have one warrior, his name is Jonathan. And with him we have the guy that holds the armor for the guy fighting. One soldier and one armor bearer. We'll call him Brother Armor Bear, okay? If you don't, you know, we don't know what his name is. That sounds good to me. If you don't like that, get your own sermon. You can call him whatever you want to. We're going to call him Brother Armor Bear tonight. We have Jonathan and Brother Armor Bear. In other words, the idea, you get the idea. Jonathan gets in there in battle. He starts whacking and hacking Philistines. And he decides that he doesn't want this sword. He wants a longer sword. He goes back. The Armor Bear's there. He's got the stuff. He, he takes one, gives him the other. If he needs the axe, he'll give him the axe. You get the idea. So we have one soldier and one Armor Bear. That makes... Two people on this side. Over here on this side, way up on the mountain, who do we have? We have the garrison of the Philistines. I bet you're wondering right about now how many is in a garrison. Director of Church Revitalization, all the way from Nashville, I'm fixing to tell you. How many are in a garrison? A heap more than the two of them standing down here. Now listen. I, I, I don't know. A garrison is the military center. It is the headquarters for an army. In the chapter before, it tells us that at Michmash, the Philistines had 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and soldiers as of the sand of the seashore. I present to you again, a heap more than the two of them standing down here. And so as Jonathan and Brother Armor Bear go to battle, they are going completely undermanned. You say, well, you're right, that's bad. Oh, but it gets worse. You say, how, how could it get any worse? Oh, listen, notice secondly, they are going undermanned in the battle while others are unconcerned. How many believe that everything in the Bible is there for a purpose? God doesn't make any mistakes. And notice after we have this brave and bold battle plan in verse 1, the scene changes to verse 2 where we find our fearless leader, the man that should be daring to do great things, Saul. And where do we find him? He's about 45 minutes to an hour away, way out of the front lines. 
And, and the Bible goes into great detail to tell us that Saul is sitting down under a pomegranate tree and there's 600 soldiers with him. Must have been a pretty good sized pomegranate tree. Now I don't know what kind of an image verse 2 gives to you, but I get the kind of visual image of Saul. He's sitting out there on a lawn chair. He's got a couple people fanning him. Got some sunglasses on. And he's maybe munching on a pomegranate. How demoralizing. Here's Jonathan braving, daring to try to do great things. And he looks back and there is Saul, the leader of this outfit. He is under a pomegranate tree, way away from the field of battle. Would it be inconceivable for Jonathan to ask the question, if he doesn't care about this deal, why should I care? If he doesn't care, why should I stick my neck out? Why am I out here doing what I'm trying to do my very best while he and 600 others are sitting on the seat of do nothing? Instead of standing on God's promises, they're sitting on the premises. They're under man. Others are unconcerned. You say, that's pretty bad. Oh, yeah, but it gets worse. How could it get any worse? Notice number three, they go, and we see it twice in these verses that I've read in your presence tonight. They are going, Jonathan and Brother Armour Bear are going into battle for the greatest, it's really a suicide mission for all intents and purposes. They are daring to do great things, and they are going into battle the most important day of their life. They are going completely unnoticed. They're undermanned. Others are unconcerned, and they are going completely unnoticed. Notice, did you see it? Saul did not know. He did not tell his dad what he was doing. Saul has no clue what the plan is. And then a couple verses later, it says that the people had no idea that Jonathan was gone. You know what that means? They're headed to a day. Surely they are filled with fear. Surely they're having some second thoughts, but there's nobody there. There's no band there playing. There's no farewells. There's no parade. There's no pats on the back. There's no texts or calls of encouragement. There's no cards. There's not going to be any care packages. There's not going to be cheers or praise or plaudits or compliments. They are going into the most important day of their life, and they are going completely. They are trying to do something great for their country and for their God, and they are laboring completely unnoticed. You say, you're right, preacher, that's bad. Oh, but it gets worse. You say, how can it get any worse? I'm telling you, it gets a whole lot worse. Hey, they're going completely. They're undermanned. Others are unconcerned. They're going unnoticed. But notice, fourthly, they are going onto an unlevel field of battle. Oh, man. Listen, anybody, now listen, they don't have the numbers. They are completely outnumbered, yes. But any, any student of military history can tell you and I'm a big history buff. Anybody can tell you that even if you don't have the numbers, even if you're outnumbered, there, if you have a couple of things going for you, you might be able to get something done. If you have the element of surprise, and if you have the high ground, you might be able to get something done. Oh, listen, I think about in the Battle of Gettysburg, in the Civil War, I think of down the Union line at the end of that fish hook line, there in a place called Little Round Top, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain led the 20th Maine. They were up on that little hill. And the, the fellows from Mississippi are coming up the hill. The, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine, they, they are outnumbered. And they have, no more, uh, they have no more ammunition. But Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain ordered fixed bayonets. And he ordered them to charge down the hill. They had the high ground and the element of surprise. And they won the day. And some people think that was, uh, that was what won the war, was holding that line. And so if you got the element of surprise and you got good high ground, you can get something done. Well, now, do these two have high ground? No, they don't. Matter of fact, they're on the bottom. They're on the bottom looking up. Matter of fact, do you remember what it says? As they charge up the hill, they're climbing on their hands and knees. They don't have the high ground. They got the low ground. And look, did you notice right before they ever get to where they got to go up the hill, did you see that there's two sharp rocks? Did you see that part? 
There's a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. Did you even notice that those rocks had names? Who knew that anybody named rocks? But they must have been so spectacular or so really sharp or rough to get through. Somebody decided to name them. One was named Bozes and one was named Sina. I bet you're wondering right now, reckon what those names mean. Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm fixing to tell you. Hey, listen, over here, this sharp rock over here, called Bozes. You know what that means in the original language? It means rock. Just let that settle in. That's deep, isn't it? Over here, the sharp rock over here, it's called Sina. You know what that means in the original language? A hard or thorny place. So ladies and gentlemen, that means that Jonathan and Brother Iron Bear are literally starting out their battle between a rock and a hard place. That. But wait a minute, preacher. At least they've got the element of surprise. Were you reading along with me? They get to the foot of the hill. Garrison's up there listening. And Jonathan puts his arm around Brother Armor Bear and said, Brother Armor Bear, this is the plan. First thing we're going to do, we're going to yell up there and introduce ourselves. Did you read that? I mean, I read it. Did you see it? And then he said, if they say, come on up, we'll know that's a sign from God that the battle is ours. Have you ever heard of a worse battle plan in your life? But that's what they do. Brother Armor Bear said, I'm with you. And so Jonathan yells at her, you Philistines, it's us. And did you see what happened? The Philistines looked down and they said, looky here. Who's crawled out of the holes, the little cowards, the Israelites are down there. And remember what they said? Come on up and we'll show you a thing. Can you kind of read between the lines? I mean, I can hear them sharpening up the axes and the swords up there. They're going to start whacking and hacking the Israelites. They said, boy, we're going to win a battle today absolutely has to be the worst conceived battle plan of all time except for one thing Jonathan had a secret that the Philistines did not know about and that was that Jonathan knew as many of them as there was up there and as few as there was down here and there's 600 over there doing nothing under a pomegranate tree Jonathan knew there was somebody else on that field of battle that day. They couldn't see him, but the God of heaven was looking down. And here was Jonathan's plan. He said, Brother Armour Bear, we're going to go up the side of that hill. We're going to do everything we physically can in this situation. And it's not going to be enough to carry the day. I mean, there's just the two of us. It's not going to be enough. We know that. But if we go and do everything we can, just maybe the God of heaven will look down and say, hey, I'm going to honor those boys' faithfulness. And it, it just may be that the God of heaven gets involved in this deal. And if he decides to fight on our side, it doesn't matter if there's a million of them up there. Because God's God, and it does, he doesn't care how many of the enemy, how big it is, how bad it looks, how hopeless it is. If God gets involved, business is fixing to pick up in this deal. Now, Brother Armand Bear, I don't know if that's the way it's going to all pan out. God may decide. Be, hey, listen, Jonathan was not in the, he wasn't in the televangelist crowd, you know, the name it and claim it, nab it and crab it and order God around like he's some celestial bellboy. He said, no, we're going to humbly ask God to do his will in this situation. Can he do it? It just may so that's what they did. They climbed up on their hands and knees. And they got up there, and Jonathan started whacking and hacking Philistines, and they knew that he was coming. And notice this, that the arm, brother armor bear, he got so fired up, he started whacking and hacking Philistines too. Hey, if you get a burden, if you get on fire for the Lord, it might be contagious, and somebody else might get the vision that you've got. So two against that great number. And in an acre of ground, they killed on the two of them on their own, killed about 20. I think that's pretty good. But now you can see, you can just imagine how tired they are. You can see the sword, the hand growing weary with the sword in it. They've done everything that they can do. And now they're still coming like a flood. 
but the God of heaven looked down and said, boy, those two boys are really doing something. I'm going to honor their work and their faithfulness. And God caused an earthquake. And the ground began to shake and then a confusion broke out and the Philistines started, got confused and started whacking and hacking at each other. And so the dust is going up and everybody's yelling and screaming and now Philistines are killing each other and guess who woke up under the pomegranate tree from his long winter's nap? Old Saul got up and said, boys, it looks like something's happening. Mount up. And 600 got involved. And the long story short, at the end of the day, the Philistines were routed off the field of battle and God won a great victory. All because one man dared to believe in a God that was able to do the miraculous. Can it happen, Jonathan? It may be. And hey, I believe Jonathan would tell us you never know what God can do until you commit yourself to go and test Him and try Him and commit yourself to do everything that you can. Well, what's the application to that story to us? Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, can I tell you this? I believe that we find ourselves as a church, and as individual Christians, in a very similar situation to the situation that Jonathan and his armor bearer found themselves. As we go to battle, we are in the greatest army that ever fought. We are in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we go to war in this modern day that we live in, do we go undermanned? Are we outnumbered? I present to you absolutely we are outnumbered. I believe that we're outnumbered. And not, listen, we are not the moral majority. We are the minority. And I believe we're getting smaller. I'm talking about true Bible-believing Christians. I believe we are in the minority. I believe that we are living in a country. We hear a lot about the word tolerance in our country today. But the fact of the matter is, our country seemingly is just about tolerant of just about anything and everything except Bible-believing Christians and Bible-believing churches. We're undermanned. You may feel as a church under man. You look out and you see all the things that the world and the devil offers to people. And boy, it seems like we're just living in the, the last days and uh, people seemingly don't want to hear the truth and they're shocked by it and everybody wants to politically correct nonsense. And it seems, boy, it may feel like we're really tremendously at a disadvantage under man. Yes, we are. And while we are laboring doing our best for Jesus, I'm talking to pastors, I'm talking to deacons and church workers and Sunday school teachers and faithful people in the church, and I believe there's a lot of them here tonight on a Tuesday night of a revival meeting, it certainly is demoralizing to look around while we are trying to do something for God that others who should be caring about this deal seemingly are unconcerned. Listen. I'll be honest with you, I'm talking about me now. My worst day as a pastor every year, the grumpiest day I ever had as a pastor was every year after our revival or our camp meeting was the Sunday morning afterwards when I got up and looked out at a bunch of people that I knew hadn't darkened a door all week. Ooh, it used to make me so mad. Oh, here we put all this expense and time and prayer and effort into it. People so faithful, people that would, would run from work to get there and they'd be tired and worn out and come all week and then people that could have been there and weren't. Listen, that can take your joy. That can take your, we can get that Martha syndrome. Remember Mary and Martha? Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Martha was in the kitchen and can I tell you, Martha was doing a good thing because Martha was making the biscuits. And that is an important job. Amen? I'm telling you, I believe she was making buttermilk biscuits. I'm not talking, I believe she wasn't making hypocrite biscuits. I'm not talking about Pillsbury Doughboy, you know, kind you hit across the counter. I think she was making real biscuits, bless God. That's good preaching right there. Listen, I believe she was doing a good thing. She was cooking, but she allowed herself to be robbed of her joy because she started looking at what Mary was doing. And remember, Jesus chastised her. He said, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things. Boy, if, if Jonathan would have allowed himself to, he could have got so mad, 
Saul and those 600 others that weren't doing anything could have caused him to sit down and do nothing. It's demoralizing. Apathy is a thing we're battling in our churches. Boy, that church pollster, he was out in the parking lot after church interviewing people as they came out of church. They said, sir, we'd like to interview you about the church. said, we found that the two biggest problems in the church today are apathy and ignorance. What do you think about that? He went to his car. He said, I don't know and I don't care. It's what we're battling. And then we labor a lot of times unnoticed. Listen, I hope that your service for God, whatever it is that you do, I hope that you don't do it for praise and plaudits because there's going to come a time that you're going to be working. You're going to be doing something and there's nobody going to see it and nobody's going to notice or maybe the people that do see it don't appreciate it, don't say anything about it and you're going to get depressed and you're going to get mad and you're going to get bitter. There's going to come a time where you've got to check yourself and make sure that you're doing what you're doing for the right reason. It can be very demoralizing. Very demoralizing for a pastor. I know a pastor, <clears throat> his church had to vote whether they were going to have a pastor appreciation service and it passed with a 13 to 11 vote that that was a great pastor appreciation service. And he had to set his tables up for his own thing and had to go pick up his own cake. Might well not even have it. What's well, demoralizing. Laboring unnoticed. And then are we on unlevel ground? We certainly are battling the devil on unlevel ground. We are looking uphill. We are in a culture that's anti-God and anti-Bible, apathy and unconcern, an amazingly wicked country that we live in. We are in an unlevel. And, and listen, let's take this out of the church right now. I want to ask you in your life, what is it that you're going through? As Jonathan and Brother Armabar looked up at that huge garrison, how intimidated they must have felt. I want to ask you, what is it in your life? What is the impossible situation that you face in your life right now? What is it that's bearing, and bearing down on your shoulders? What is it that is hurting you? That secret pain that you carry on with. You come to church and maybe nobody knows that you're going through it. It's a depression, a despair. That that keeps you up late at night. That that troubles you and causes you tears on your pillow at night. And you look at it and you say, I don't know any human way possible for this thing to work out. What is your impossible situation? Man, it looks bad. I know some of you are thinking, boy, I thought you were supposed to be an encouragement to churches. Man, this is the most depressing sermon I've ever... Hey, listen, here's, it, here, my message is very simple tonight. Look up here, I'm easy to spot. I believe this with all my heart. If I didn't believe this, I would not be here tonight in this revival. I believe with all of my heart, I believe that the same God that Jonathan called on, the same God that was looking down on that field of battle is still on the throne tonight. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And he is available. And he is still able to do the impossible in your situation that you have no idea. Listen, it doesn't matter how big the situation. It doesn't matter how hopeless it is. It may be a wayward loved one. It may be a lost person you've been praying for for so long. It may be a physical problem. It may be the loss of a loved one that you just can't get over. It may be a financial problem, a marital problem. It may be a church problem. I don't care what it is because it does not matter how big the mountain may seem God is able. And I believe he's still able to send revival. And I believe he is still able to save sinners, to revive saints, and to grow our churches for the glory of God. Now listen, we say we believe that God. We say we've trusted him for our eternal salvation. But listen, the key to this whole deal tonight is do we really believe it enough to give him our impossible situation? Or are we going to keep it ourselves and be miserable? Now, you say, preacher, are you guaranteeing, you saying if you bring your burden to the altar that the Lord just going to miraculously turn? No, I'm not saying that. 
God can do anything he wants to and sometimes his ways are way higher than ours and sometimes it doesn't have a happy end. What I am saying is he is able and it just may be. We don't know what he can do. Can he send revival? Can he grow one of the greatest and largest free will Baptist churches from North Carolina? It may be. Can he call preachers? Can he send revival? Can he start a nationwide revival? From here, it may be. Can God save your loved one? Can he turn your situation around? It may be. He's still God, isn't he? And so, yes, it is possible. But I believe our problem is that we've lost the faith to believe that and to dare to trust God with our situation. But can I tell you, time and time again, I have seen this played out over and over and over again. I tell folks in my job, I don't have a potion. I don't have magic words to build a church. I already told you last night I don't have a pedigree. But I, I do have some things that I can offer our churches. And one of those things is hope. I was called to, to, uh, to Florida to, uh, to help a, a struggling church barely keeping their doors open. On that Sunday morning, we started that revitalization revival. There were 12 people in attendance. But you know what I could look out and tell those 12 people? I could tell them the story of our church in Ohio, in a rural area, in a rundown 150-year-old building, 12 people in 1989 that didn't have a pastor, and they decided to vote whether they were going to keep the doors open or not. And I could tell him that I was an eyewitness. I had a, a, a ringside seat to God revitalizing that congregation, completely relocating it, two building projects over the years. And the last Sunday, when I said goodbye, almost 500 in attendance in that same church. Listen, can God do it? It may be. Listen, you never know what God could do if we will not give him our situation. I was uh, in revival and the pastor told me about a lady there in the church that had been praying for her son for years. Matter of fact, she got so burdened, they were having some cottage prayer meetings in this, before this revival, and she scheduled one of those cottage prayer meetings at her house. She was hoping that her son would get to fellowship with God's people and hear the prayers and, and would, uh, would, would get saved and get, get right or at least come to church. Well, as soon as the people started coming into the house for a cottage prayer meeting, he ran out the back door. I mean, he was under conviction. So we're in the revival. We come down to the last service. It's Wednesday night, and the pastor nudged me, and he said, would you look who's here? And I looked over, and about the third row back over here, it was that, I could tell, that was that lady's son that she'd been praying for for years to come to church. Now, I got to tell you, as a preacher on that revival, I immediately felt pressure. I thought, boy, I've got to. I mean, you know, it's all on me. You know, I'm, I'm the man of the hour. I mean, it's just, this lady's been praying for this boy to get in church, and now I'm the one. You know, it's all about me. It's my, my, my I got to have some points here. I got to have something flowery to say because it's all about us, right? That's the devil's biggest lie. It's never about us. It's not about our ability. It's our availability to let him take over the situation. But so I was really sweating. And all the way through church, I could see her with her eyes closed. She was mouthing. I could tell she was praying. Boy, when we got to the invitation, immediately she hit the altar, that mother sobbing and praying. Everybody in the building, including that boy, knew what she was praying for. She's praying he'd get it right. And then there we are in the invitation, and it's just me and him and everybody else in the invitation. And now I think, now I've really got to bring it home. I've got to reel him in. I've got to say something. I've got to have something flowery to say to get that boy to the altar. But here's what happened. I looked down and I saw her, she was crying, and all those ladies around her praying with that godly mother that had been praying, and it touched me so much, I got choked up, I couldn't get anything out. I couldn't say anything. I just stood there and I started crying. But when that mother had done everything she could, and the preacher had done everything he could, God looked down in that service, and he took control of the situation. And in a minute or two, that boy hit the altar and was gloriously saved. Now, does that happen every time? No, there's a lot of lost people leave out of this, these doors unsaved. But can it happen? It may be. But when's the last time we got so concerned that we shed tears 
for the lost. When's the last time we hit the altar so burdened for that lost person? Oh, if we'll go and do our part, it's no telling what God just may do. But the question is, are we willing to do our part? It may be. I can take you to a, a couple in northeast Ohio, part of our church, J.P. and Nancy Coons. And for Nancy Coons prayed for her husband, J.P., for 50 years. Can you imagine praying for your husband to be saved 50 years? You reckon it ever got discouraging to her? You reckon she ever thought it's never going to happen? I'd go to the house and I'd witness to him. I'd say, J.P., you need to get right with the Lord. And he'd say, I'm just biding my time, preacher. And I thought, biding your time? I mean, you're retired. You're no spring chicken. You've got a lot of physical problems. Today's the day of salvation. Biden, your time. He was a good man, but he was a lost man. There's a lot of people like that, you know. Sometimes they're the hardest to, to reach. One Sunday morning, I don't know why I did it. The Lord just impressed upon me. I told him to, to, to have ready for the invitation, the song, the anchor holds. I never sing for the invitation. We just do, usually do a regular... But that morning I sang that song. That song is five minutes and 42 seconds long. And J.P. later said, Preacher, that song was just one minute too long because he said, I, I gripped that pew for four minutes and a half. And after 50 years, God finally broke through. And he looked at his wife and said, Let's go. And after praying for him for 50 years, she thought he meant let's go home. And Nancy got in the, out in the aisle and headed to the door and turned around and J.P. was headed to the altar. I will never forget that day as long as I live. I will never forget him collapsing down at the altar. And I went over there and again as the preacher I got to lead him to the Lord and the same thing that set on, on me on that revival in Florida, same thing, I couldn't say anything. But he was already praying, Lord you know what a sinner I've been. But Lord if you'll be merciful to me, if you'll have me, I said, he's doing a pretty good job himself. Their daughter had, been praying, had prayed for years for him. She was working with our children. They were working on the Christmas program in Children's Church, and the sound man ran and got her. He didn't tell her what was going on. She said, he said, it's your dad, it's your dad. I mean, he didn't tell her if he was dead or what was going on, but she knew because she sounded like a Comanche Indian coming down the hall. We could hear her all the way through. Hey, listen, can it happen? It may be. I could take you and introduce you to a lady, and I just talked to her recently. Her name is Julie Gosen. And Julie was in our church, and she, at a very early age, she was only in her 50s, she got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And Julie still had a burden, even with her mind and her memory going, she wanted to find something to do for the Lord. She was a very artsy, craftsy person. Had beautiful handwriting. And one day she brought me a card that she had made, it uh, had little frilly things out, you know, ribbons on it. And she had, in, by hand, in beautiful cursive writing, had written out the plan of salvation, A, B, C, admit that you're a sinner, had all the scriptures, Romans 3, 23, had written that out in hand. I thought, boy, Julie, this is beautiful. I thought, with, with everything going on with her, it had to take her hours to put that together. But one day I was visiting and, and, and went to her little apartment there in the retirement village that she lived in. And I went in that little apartment, and in the, on the kitchen table, there was all kind of looked like a craft store, all kinds of cardboard and ribbons and everything. And she had made hundreds of those little cards. And then I saw a map of the city that she lived in, and I said, Julie, what is this? And it was, there was magic marker and mark here and there. And she said, well, Pastor, she said, I can't remember the words, the right words to put on these cards. And so I have a script that I had somebody write out. She had to really talk slowly to think about what she, to, to get it out properly. But she said, I, I have a script so I can look at that to make sure I write the right words. And then when I get enough of these cards made, I take them. I can't drive anymore, but I have somebody take me with this map. She had canvassed the entire city. Every home, one by one, with the gospel that she had put down by hand. A woman with Alzheimer's. You say, I don't like it. I don't know if I like that way of doing it. I like her way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Oh, listen. 
Can God take a woman? Suffering with Alzheimer's. I talked to her recently because I wanted to get a couple of those cards. And she said, Pastor, I can't do the cards anymore, but I have two ladies that I'm training so the work can continue. It may be. You never know what God can do if we'll let him have his way. And if we'll get a hold of this simple truth tonight in our situation, what's your situation? How bad does it look tonight? What is your hopeless? What is your impenetrable garrison in your life? What is it? Can you give it to God? Can you commit it to Him? And say, God, I'm going to do everything I physically know how to do. I'm going to do everything I know. And then I'm going to leave the results with you. And Lord, you're God. It doesn't matter how impossible it looks. You're able to do great and mighty things that we don't even have any comprehension of. See, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Him. The question is very simple tonight. Do you believe that He is able? And I'll tell you something that happened. I'm going to leave you with this story and I'm done. A, a story, something that happened to me just recently that really helped me with this. I was in a, preaching an area-wide conference revival down in Georgia. Nearby was the army base, Fort Benning, Fort Benning, Georgia. Big army base. There is an infantry museum right off, right off of that army base. I'm telling you, I recommend every red-blooded American ought to go through that thing. I'm telling you, I came out of there so fired up, I wanted to go kill a terrorist. I mean, I was fired up. And, uh, but I'll I, I tell you what happened. To get on to Fort Benning, to get onto the army base, you, a, a civilian, you have to go through the main gate. You have to go to the first guard shack and they have to run a complete background check on you because of all the stuff that happened at Fort Hood and all that mess. Uh, they, they gotta, you got to sit and wait till they do it. A complete FBI background check. And then you go take a piece of paper that they give you to the next guard shack and it's a whole big rigmarole to get on. you got to go through that one gate. I'll have you know, I didn't do any of that. Matter of fact, I didn't even go through the right gate. Now, so you, you're going to look at me with a little bit more respect after I tell you this. There's a little side gate right beside that museum. I'll tell you what happened. I rolled up there to that gate. That guard took my license. He took one look. He clicked his heels. He saluted and sent me right in to that army base, Fort Benning. I can see some of you are really impressed with that. Oh, I forgot one detail. I was not in the car by myself. I was just a passenger. I was riding with my friend, David Trogdon. Free Will Baptist United States Army Chaplain, David Trogdon. Newly minted and decorated Lieutenant Colonel David. And that soldier never saw my ID because David Trogdon put my ID with his lieutenant colonel badge and he put that out the window. It didn't matter who I was. I was with somebody important. And when he saw that lieutenant colonel badge, he handed my license and David Trogdon's badge back, clicked his heels and saluted the lieutenant colonel. And I got onto that base. Had nothing to do with Jim McComas. It had everything to do with who I was riding. And what I'm telling you tonight in our churches and in our lives and in our hopeless situations, it had nothing to do with Jonathan. It had nothing to do with the armor bearer. It had everything to do with who was standing with them. He is still God. He is still on the throne. There is still hope for our churches. There is still hope for our ministries. There is still hope in your impossible situation for your marriage, for your children, for your wayward grandchildren, for your financial problem, for whatever problem you got on the job, for whatever church problem, there is still hope because He is still God. The question is, are we bold enough and brave enough to commit it to Him and say, God, I'm going to do everything I can and then I'm trusting you to do the rest. What can he do? Can he still do miracles? It may be.